Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website can be found at scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives, and that's where you go to support this mission of truth. Well, we're starting a new study this week, and we're going to be studying the gospel according to Matthew. Now, we did this study uh, several, several years ago. And I'd have to look it up, but I want to say it was about five years ago. Um, But yesterday morning I was praying and just felt led that it would be important to go back through the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, with some fresh eyes uh, now that it's been a few years. Now we have recently completed some of the other gospels because we did all of them. Um... But we're going to go back through Matthew. Matthew is is filled with lots of uh, prophecy. Um, there's just a lot here that might speak to us today. And I thought about doing the book of Revelation again, which is also a study that we did, but, we, but it's been five or six years ago. However, we're going through our study in the book of Isaiah which causes us to go to the book of Revelation often. And so this makes the most sense. And so that's what we're going to be doing uh, for the foreseeable future. So with that, uh, let me give you a few details about the book of Matthew. And then we're going to get started. We're going to read, we're going to read chapter one and two, which really just deals with the genealogy and the birth of our Messiah. Uh, which we'll be talking about the genealogy and stuff a little bit. Here's what Matthew Henry says about uh, the book of Matthew, which I found interesting, as kind of like his open to his commentary. He says, Matthew, surnamed Levi, before his conversion, was a publican or a tax gatherer under the Romans at Capernaum. He is generally allowed to have written his gospel before any other of the evangelists. The contents of the gospel and the evidence of the ancient writers show that it was written primarily for the use of the Jewish nation. The fulfillment of prophecy was regarded by the Jews as strong evidence. Therefore, this is especially dealt upon by St. Matthew. Here are particularly selected such parts of the Savior's history and discourses as were best suited to awaken the Jewish nation to a sense of their sins, to remove their erroneous expectations of an earthly kingdom, to abate their pride and self-conceit, to teach them the spiritual nature and extent of the gospel, and to prepare them for the admission of the Gentiles into the church. I like uh, Matthew Henry's uh, thoughts here about the book of Matthew. Uh, the only thing I would disagree with is he mentions to remove their erroneous expectations of an earthly kingdom, which they were wrong. That, that what was coming upon the earth was a spiritual kingdom. However, I do believe, and we believe, and obviously it's part of our blessed hope, that there will at some point be an actual earthly kingdom headed by our Messiah. But we certainly could be wrong about our understanding where that is concerned. But that's Matthew Henry's introduction. The only thing that I would add to it before we get started is the from the study Bible that I'm going to be using. Um, it's interesting to note that Matthew, who was one of the twelve apostles in the list of twelve, he is he explicitly calls himself a tax collector. And nowhere else in Scripture is the name Matthew associated with a tax collector. The other evangelists they always employ his former name Levi. When speaking of his spiritual past, this is evident of the humility on Matthew's part. As with the other three Gospels, this work is known by the name of its author. 
So the only person that refers to Matthew as a tax collector is Matthew himself. Because he wants to point out that he was in sin until he was rescued by our Savior. That is enough introduction. Let's start digging into our study in the Gospel of Matthew. And I just pray that it would go forth, it pierce your hearts, cause you to draw closer to him. Let's begin. I will be reading from the NSAB, uh, whereas we did all of our previous studies out of the King James, just to have another, just to have a different look. And I pray you'll be blessed. Let's begin. Chapter 1, the Gospel according to Matthew. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zariah by Tamar. Perez Perez was the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram. And Ram was the father of Abinadab, and Abinadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon was the father of Boaz by Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David the king. And David was the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asa, and Asa was the father of Josaphat, and Josaphat the father of Jeram, and Jeram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah was the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amon, and Amon the father of Josiah. Josiah became the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation by Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shelaiatel, and Shelaiatel the father of Zerbabel, and Zerbabel was the father of Abihud, and Abihud the father of Elikam. And Eliakim the father of Azur, and Azur the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim and Achim the father of Eliad, and Eliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are fourteen generations from David to the deportation to Babylon. Fourteen generations from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah. Fourteen generations. Please note. By the way, Matthew's not bashful about who Jesus is. That's the first thing to note. The very first verse. The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. The son of David, the son of Abraham. And then at the end here. By Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. And then he says, from the deportation of Babylon to Messiah, 14 generations. Now, Luke's genealogy is slightly different. He goes through a lot more. Um, But where it really is an obvious difference is this. Matthew points out that it goes from Jacob, who was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born. But Luke says, Joseph, the son of Heli, not Joseph, the son of Jacob, like what Matthew says, Joseph, the son of Heli. Now, it's believed by many scholars, and this is how it's reconciled, is that Luke is going through the actual genealogy of Mary, the earthly parent, which would mean it goes Joseph, meaning her father, not 
Joseph, meaning her husband. So it, it appears, and this is how it's reconciled again by many scholars, is that Matthew goes all the way through the genealogy, but then goes through Joseph the stepfather, whereas Luke is going through the actual blood of Mary, bloodline of Mary. That is what is believed as to why there is a difference uh, at the end of these genealogies here. And I'm glad that Luke does do that because I personally uh, find it's not super overwhelming to go through the stepfather, right? Because we know there's a supernatural birth. Not that Joseph doesn't deserve respect and, and reverence and all of those things, because he does. But he would not be the actual bloodline. It would be through Mary and that the Messiah came, not through Joseph's blood. Continuing on, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. A couple things to note here. Obviously, they call his name Yahushua or Yeshua, which literally does mean Jehovah saves. Right? Um, that's why it's that's why they said call him this because he will save his people from their sins. The other thing is, is he calls him Joseph, son of David. And you're like, wait, I just thought he was the son of da of Jacob. This is just a title, meaning he is a descendant of King David. So even though he's the stepfather, he is also like Mary, a descendant from King David, which fulfills prophecy. Continuing on, verse twenty two. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her virgin until she gave birth to, this, to a son, and called his name Jesus. So Joseph, when he finds out she's pregnant, he's like, whoa, that's not from me. And he, won't, he decides he's going to divorce her secretly. But obviously God sends the, an angel to give him a vision. So now he knows what's really going on. And he goes ahead and he marries her, but he doesn't touch her until after the son is born. Chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judah, in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judah. For this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judea, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, for out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent him to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me so that I too may come and worship him. And after hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until they came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with joy, with great joy. And after coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. 
and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. And in opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left their own country by another way. Please note, this is just something interesting to think about. Obviously, there's no scriptural evidence from this. And I believe I heard this theory from Michael Rood, from a Rood Awakening many, many years ago. And the theory is this. Where are these magi from the East? Like, how did they know all of this? And the theory is that, that these came, these magi actually are coming from Babylon. And the reason that they know the story and the prophecy is because of a great mighty teacher that was there for many, many years who was like in a position of high power. That teacher would be Daniel. And the prophet Daniel had no descendants. And so the theory is this. They knew about the prophecies because they were handed down from Daniel. And the gifts that they're bringing were the inheritance that Daniel would have potentially left behind, wealth, possessions, or whatever, that were never transferred to a descendant. It's a wild theory, and maybe that's not why they're bringing the gifts of frankincense and all that. Maybe they're just bringing that out of their own possessions and wealth. But the theory that they know this information because of the prophet Daniel does make sense. And... I think it would be beautiful if there was some, uh, you know, documents or something discovered in the somewhere that kind of lended credit to that. But that's just something to chew on. Not don't make that gospel, right? Don't make that fact. But it sure does, sure does make a lot of sense. And obviously, it doesn't tell us that there's three magi. You know, that tradition is just a a tradition. Uh, there could have been ten or fifteen of them, for all we know. Obviously, Herod is lying. He wants to find out who it is so that he can eliminate what he perceives as to be a threat. And like the commentary from Matthew Henry states that we read at the beginning, Matthew's pointing out all these prophetic fulfillments because that was uh, valuable to Jewish readers and and those who would be Jewish converts they needed to see that there was a prophetic there was prophetic fulfillments of all of this and of course we know that to be true now we have this flight to Egypt so let's continue on here verse 13 now when they had gone behold an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream And he said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up, and he took the child and his mother while it was still night, and he left for Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Please note, this is one example as to why I believe that prophecy has multiple fulfillments. Out of Egypt I have called my son. This was dealing with the exodus of of Israel. But now Matthew's saying it also is a fulfillment here. So there is two fulfillments, one prophecy. Not only this, it... You wouldn't even think, like if you were just reading the Torah, you wouldn't even think that this statement out of Egypt I have called my son is even prophetic to begin with. Because it's just a statement made, right? When they were called out of Egypt. But Matthew says, no, no, no. It was also a prophetic utterance. And it is dealing with this very story where Joseph has to take Mary and the Messiah child flee to Egypt to hide from Herod but then when Herod dies they're able to come out of Egypt fulfilling this making this this prophecy fulfilled verse 16 
Then when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged, and he sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all of its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah, Judea, in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. This was to, was, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. Now, what's interesting is it's going to be difficult to find the <laughs> prophecy where it says that he would be called a Nazarene. And so one of the explanations for this is that it's likely that Matthew is using the word Nazarene as a synonym for someone who is despised or detestable. Other people say that it means it's actually referring to the branch because the scriptures over and over talk about Messiah as being a branch, the branch, and that that's actually what it means. And this is kind of like a interesting way of pointing that out. But there is not a scripture that says, at least not in this, the the collection of scriptures that we have that, that says he would come from Nazareth or anything like that, or that he would be called a Nazarene. So just something interesting to think about. Well, that is the beginning or the introduction, the opening to our study in the gospel according to Matthew. And I know we haven't really gotten to any meat and potatoes just yet. We're just kind of dealing with the birth and some introductional thoughts, but I pray that you've been blessed this morning uh, by this study and that it, my goal always, and sometimes I have to remind myself of what the mission is, what the goal is, and that is just to read the Bible so that people would hear it and have faith and have their faith strengthened and come to Christ, come to Messiah come to salvation because I believe the time in the window is short and we need to spend more time talking about Messiah and not just uh, other things that might interest us. And so we're going to be talking about the gospel of the kingdom of God and the gospel of Messiah. And I appreciate you tuning in, listening and giving your time to me. That's all I have for this morning. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.